Hidden Stories Healed Now. Those of you that have been following all of these shows know that on a previous season, we had the opportunity to talk to Mrs. Darlene Quincy. And she talked to us about the unfortunate loss of her husband, where her actual nephew is the one who killed him. It was a very touching story with all the challenges that she's been through. I got a lot of requests that people wanted to know what happened next. How did, how did it evolve? Because we never got a chance to talk about what actually happened in court, what happened with the family afterwards, how she's been trying to move her life forward and onward. As we know, David will always be in her heart and never forgotten. And the things that she does to keep his hope and drive alive. So we're gonna think, we're gonna talk about that today, um, and to really understand how do you really move on. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Not a problem. So when we left our last discussion, um, and we had just gotten to the point of understanding that what your nephew had done of stabbing your husband and um, killing him, mm -hmm. and um, dealing with the fact that it was in your mom's house mm -hmm. and the challenges you were dealing with, with your, you know, trying to, to go through the next step. So I want to pick up off when it was time to go to court. Okay. And, and talk to me about that process and what happened. Right. That, that process is actually, it's very interesting uh, when you have um, anyone, I guess, that goes to court. But for us, um, you have a 17 year old, which was my nephew. And um, it was almost like for about two and a half years that we heard nothing about a court hearing. So here a young man is 17 years old. I think about my, my son, he's 16 and, and next month he'll be 17. Imagine a 17 year old, really a kid, sitting in jail for almost two and a half years, not knowing what the next steps would be for him, not, not that I was overly concerned about him as much as I just wanted to move on with life. And I wanted to know what was going to happen. My kids were asking me questions about, so is he going to jail? Is he going to come back and hurt us? Um, you know, what's going to happen with him? So um, it was almost like about, we, I followed up quite a bit with the uh, district attorney. They kept us engaged as much as possible. So um, we then get a, a court date. And I believe it was, it was Maybe, maybe about three years ago, um, that we finally got a date for trial. And, um, and you still don't really know what that means to get a, a, a date. And uh, I, I, I know that as a family, we went, it was my children, my two children, myself, my mother went. Um, everyone could attend and be, be in the courtroom, uh, but they didn't allow me to be in the courtroom. Um, and they weren't sure if they were gonna ask me to be a witness or to be a, a representative to speak on behalf of the, the uh, DA. Um, and so I was never in the courtroom, um, but my, my kids didn't go in, but my niece, who is my nephew's sister, was able to go in. My mother went in and we had some family members that went to court. And so, you know, I, I missed out on all of the, the things that you see in a courtroom, but imagine what you see on TV is real. You know, those things that happen where they have all of the uh, the weapons that were used, the bags that are taped up with the evidence. The one thing I do remember seeing is when I got into the courtroom, um, there was a, a cart, you know, like you roll the cart into. There was a cart and on the cart there was uh, the evidence. And I knew one of the longer uh, bags or, or a bag was on the, the, the table and it contained and it said knife which was the knife that stabbed my husband. Then it had um, some other evidence that they collected over, I guess, over the process of you know, gathering the material. But when I saw on the, the table this knife, or the, what said a knife, I stopped. It, it was almost like I, I, I couldn't breathe. I, I didn't know, just imagine someone dying with what was on the table. And so, and then eventually they asked me, of course, I couldn't stay in the courtroom. I, I left out, I, I was in for the preliminary uh, conversation. I didn't see my nephew. Uh, and then I went out of the courtroom and uh, my kids went out with me, my mother and, and, and my other family members that were there stayed. 
But, you know, they go through the process of uh, interviewing all of the witnesses. It was a full trial. Uh, of course, they had a, a jury. Um, and um, the district attorney, of course, is there. Uh, he, my nephew. Uh, it was very interesting because during the process of putting all this together, um, he wanted to defend himself. When people are mentally um, disabled or mentally uh, going through mental challenges, their mind begins to tell them things that are, that are that should be that are really not in your best interest. Um, and so, um, just kind of speeding things up. You know, we've gone through the trial. Um, I can remember my brother-in-law. His name is David. Also, his, his name is David McDonald, and uh, he is who um, Mustafa sh uh, stayed with when my sister passed away. Uh, just kind of backtracking Mustafa. My sister's name is Jackie. She died from cancer. Mustafa then, I think, just because both of his parents were deceased, you know, mentally, I think there was a shock in his body, his mind. And so, but, so David McDonald, he comes to court as well. He come, he, he came from Texas uh, for the trial. And I can remember when we were in, uh, I was sitting in the, the lobby, just, I mean, this trial had gone on, I, I know, a week. And then it continued the next week. Mm -hmm. So imagine you got two kids, they're eight and nine. Or, I'm sorry, they were, now they're probably more like 12, 13. And um, David comes outside, David McDonald comes outside, and, uh, and I'm like, what, what's going on? And so he said, well, they have to stop the, the hearing. And I said, why are they stopping the hearing? He said, because uh, it was just announced by the psychologist during his evaluation of Mustafa that he had, in, his plans were to have killed me too. We were like, and David, he was in shock because he had, Mustafa had lived with him. But I can remember the times that he had talked about how he was fearful of a 16, 15, 16 year old boy at the time that he would lock his door at night. But when he said that, that hurt him because he loved Dave, I mean, loved Mustafa. He was the only parent remaining. Uh, and so they had to kind of stop the hearing, but they, because they thought they were going to have, have to call a mistrial, and, and they didn't. They proceeded forward. But um, so the trial goes forward, and, and um, Mustafa ended up getting uh, 30 years. 30 years with, uh, I believe, with an opportunity for um, parole in 30 years, but he has to serve a, a, a minimum of whatever the number was. Um, and so he does... Uh, get that as a, as a uh, ruling, manslaughter. And um, one of the things I, I can recall him, him uh, or was mentioned is that, you know, when people are trying to figure out why they did what they did, they, they give all these different excuses. One of the things that I remember hearing uh, from the district attorney was that they said that David potentially may, he, he suggested that David had molested him. But they're looking for ways to figure out why they did what they did. So that's a normal statement that most people that get accused or of killing, that somebody did something to them. And um, so all in all, the, the trial is, is almost over. Um, they invite me uh, to come inside as well as the kids. But one thing stood out to me and it stood out to me the other day because now my daughter is asking questions. Now in her, she's now 15. And uh, just going through the process of um, the evidence that they heard, where you hear um, they had to play the 911 tape. Mm -hmm. The 911 tape was played in the courtroom, and my, uh, my kid's godparents had to hear that. And so one of the things that they mentioned is that during the 911 that they could hear my mom screaming. Let's take a station break, and when we come back, okay. we're going to pick up from that point. We'll be right back. Every story has a hidden element that is not often shared. Hidden Stories, Healed Now with host Vicki Wright Hamilton, seeks to share the hidden gems in real life experiences. Our guests are ordinary people sharing their stories of overcoming insurmountable odds while providing hope and inspiration. Welcome back. Um, so you were talking about um, uh, where, you know, where they were at the time of the court. Yeah, so we're uh, at the part where the, the 911, now I've kind of fast forwarded and they've given the, the ruling, but I forgot to mention about the one thing that stood out and it stood out more recently because over the years, I've tried to put in the back of my mind everything that's happened, but the 911 tape, um, um, 
My mom is screaming, uh, according to my uh, children's godparents. But in the background, they can hear Mustafa. And they can hear, you know, this anger. And they can also, I think, hear David and the stabbing. They could hear that through the, the 911 tape. And so um, now the kids are getting information because now today they're beginning to ask questions about what really happened. Um, and I didn't know any of that, right? I, didn't, I, I couldn't breathe through the whole process of going through the trial. This is nothing like losing a, a spouse as much as now the next stage is, is you've got to sit through, you know, the, that next phase of hearing about every detail that's happened. The parts that I didn't want to know. I, I mean, from the, the pictures in the, the house and how the house was bloody, the floor was covered with blood. And, you know, I, I'm like, I, I don't really want to know all that. But I do remember them asking me at the very, after they had come up with um, the sentencing. And they asked me to come inside and if I wanted to say anything. And I didn't know if I wanted to say anything or not because I really couldn't even look at him. I couldn't fathom how a person that you've cared for, that you know you've got two cousins that are six and seven at the time, you could look at them and, and, and not feel some type of, there were no emotions from him. So I go up to the podium and, and I just said, you know, my sister didn't raise this person. Now, I understand when people lose parents, but there have been many people over the years that have lost both parents, but never killed in anger. And so I just, I stood at the podium and I just said, you know, my sister who had her PhD, her husband had his PhD, and they expected more from Mustafa. And he is not a statistic. He is not, um, when you start thinking about every young black male being in, in jail, that's not who he was supposed to be. He was intelligent. And, and I turned and I looked at him and I said, you know, you should look at Austin and Paige because you've changed their life forever. Yes, I'm, I'm hurting, but my kids will hurt the rest of their life because they'll never forget driving to their grandmother's house and seeing the ambulance and seeing the tape around the, the property and not ever seeing their daddy again, never. And that is something that you'll have to recall mentally in your mind how you've changed our life and how you've changed your life forever. So after all of this, um, and I know that, that it's hard, the children are growing up, mm -hmm. and now this is over, it's behind you, and you're trying to pick up to keep going. Right. And um, I know that you kept them in a lot of programs, mm -hmm. you kept them engaged, et cetera. So you said that they're starting to ask questions mm -hmm. now. and. How are, how are you able to respond without bringing up so many emotions, or do you, because of the things you went through at that time? I think it's really important for me to tell them as much as I truly know. Um, because I was not in the courtroom, um, more, more of the questions, my daughter Paige, she's asking all of the questions. Girls are a lot different than boys. My son has not asked one question about the incident uh, because he is, um, we've had some guests on uh, through some of your segments that have talked about the 504 program and IEP. My son, um, he, he was in different programs because his learning, he had a learning difference. We don't call them disabilities, learning difference. And so I don't know if he processed what happened. He knew something major happened. And so after daddy passed away, he was, he felt like he was supposed to cry. Now my daughter, fast forwarding years, uh, up until now, I'd never, she'd never really asked. Now she's cried over the years. I can tell because I didn't grow up with a father. So I knew that there was a gap or, or this empty feeling in her. Uh, and so, but recently she started asking some very detailed questions and it was very much about the trial. And it was about that 911 call and what her uh, godparents shared with her. But as she's asking these questions, I'm always very honest and, and, and I will tell her as much as I know. But what I also don't want to do is tell her so much that she goes into a depressed state or that she feels like that she's scared, you know, of every human being or she's scared of other family members or she's thinking that, you know, if I had done something different uh, or if granny had done something different. She has asked me, 
um, can she spend some time with her grandmother and asking her questions? And I said, you know, let me ask Granny if that's okay. And so last weekend, I saw my mother and I told her that Paige wanted to ask some questions. And she paused for a second because I know uh, my mother had to watch him stab. Watch your grandson stab, stab your son-in-law who she admired so much. And to have to go back through men that mental process as an, as an elder, uh, a senior, she was, I guess she was probably about 80 when that happened, right? And so I can't imagine what she went through. So now she's got to recall that information. And um, she said she was willing to talk to Paige, but she said uh, on a one-on-one, -on -one, she would do that. And, and I'm okay with that because I really don't want to know. Sometimes it's good not to have to go back and recall all of that uh, hurt and pain because as she was even my daughter, as she was telling me the story about what she'd heard from her godparent who was in the room at the court that day, I didn't want to hear it. I was just like, it was so, it, it made me recall too much that I would rather remember David with a smile on his face and see his, uh, who he is through my kids. When I look at them, I see him. And so, but I don't want to recall the times that he had to suffer with over 70 stab wounds to his body. I can't imagine that. And, and, my, and Paige did say they didn't show his full body during the courtroom, according to what she heard, that they only showed his face. But even with that, I don't want to even imagine what that looks like for her. But she will know as much as we're able to tell her, but I don't think she needs to know it all. Do you think your mother will have discernment not to tell her all to really understand that? Because I'm sure your mother has some emotions. She's yeah. dealing with it a very, very difficult. Right. I, I think what I'm going to have to do uh, for my mother, as uh, I've been her care provider over the years, and uh, and I know her memory is sharp, but it, it's also, you know, it's, it's had some challenges along the way. Uh, my role for my daughter will be to tell my mother, I give you permission to say certain things and other things. I'd ask that you just eliminate okay. those things. Those are not important for a 15 year old. Some things she's just not gonna know. She's, she'll never fill in those gaps. And for me, I think that that's okay for to, to make sure that my daughter is safe mentally. Mm -hmm. You know, because we don't wanna, you're right, that, that mental challenge mm -hmm. of being able to move forward. And you know, your son may be holding some things right. in, right? That, and as he's learning too, because I'm sure they talk to each mm -hmm. other, you know, in terms of moving forward. Well, we're gonna take a station break and when we come back, mm -hmm. we're gonna talk about how you moved on. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Every story has a hidden element that is not often shared. Hidden Stories, Healed Now with host Vicki Wright Hamilton, seeks to share the hidden gems in real life experiences. Our guests are ordinary people sharing their stories of overcoming insurmountable odds while providing hope and inspiration. Welcome back. So, you know, Darlene, um, as we've been talking and I, I, that story just, I'll never forget the moment when I found out and the chills that went through my body. And I have always admired you, your strength, your ability to move forward, to deal with your children, your mother, and, and your faith. Mm -hmm. And I know that you, know, you, you do a lot through singing mm -hmm. and you have a gorgeous voice. Um, and I know that you know, you've had to find some some ground to be able to be you. So how did you move on? What did you do? Um, I just make it look easy. <laughs> and it's not easy. I it know. isn't, you know, it's, you know, as strong, independent women, yet, you know, we've been married, yet you have your own income, yet you are uh, a manager or a leader. Um, all we know is, you know, from what we've learned from our parents and, and my mom, she was just always a strong person. So even through the hard times or the tough times or not having enough money or not having enough, enough you know, to, to feed the family or uh, very little, she survived. And I can just remember watching my mom over the years. Uh, this never happened to her, but I've watched her lose a spouse. I've, I've seen her um, not cry or cry, but, you know, we had to move on. And so that didn't mean I for, forgot, right? My journey was that I initially, you know, decided 
You know, I was on the floor crying, lay, laying prostrate on the floor, uh, prostrate rather on the floor, and, and I didn't know what to do at those moments and times where everybody's looking at you. My mom is relying on me. She's taking the blame. She's wondering if her daughter's going to hate her. You got kids, two kids that are, you know, seven and eight, six or seven rather, and you're not sure what to do. But I knew that on the ground, there was nothing for me. So had I stayed on the ground, my life, I, I mean, I didn't have a moment to really be depressed. Let me say that because depression tried to really creep in. And I think for about, I'm going to say about five or six months, I was walking or, or I was just on autopilot. I, I didn't know what was happening in my life. I was going to work. I was managing a team and, and I thought that I would have grace at work. And I really don't feel like I even got the grace that I needed. I was I was I, I was made to feel like I need to come back in and hit the ground running. And um, and then, you know, just this knower, this knowing on the inside of you that just said, you know what, you don't have to be a superwoman all the time. You, it's OK to cry. It's OK to say, you know, um, I'm going to take a, one one step at a time. One of the big things that I did for myself um, was I was managing a team at my job and I decided one day I walked in and I said, I can't do it anymore. So I just called my boss and I said, I'm not going to be able to do this anymore. Not knowing whether I would have a job or not, but he was able to, you know, and this happened about probably more like four or five years later or no, 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 maybe a couple of years later. But I, I, I just knew I had to do that. And and the, and then the business that we're in and IT, I'm an IT professional. You just don't walk in and say, I'm not going to do this. You better have another job to go to. But I was I felt like I was led to to say what I said and knowing that I was going to have grace to be able to move forward. And um, and so the things that helped me was that I because I do walk by faith. That, that didn't still mean that I forgot. So I was able to minister my hurt and my pain through praise and worship. And I could cry and I could be vulnerable and I could, you know, still be Darlene, it, even though people saw me as being a strong individual. And, and I am that, but I don't know anything different. Right. And so, but I could still cry and worship and, and still be transparent because what happens is when people lose someone, everyone is kind of tiptoeing over the subject. They're tiptoeing over what does life look like? Or, you know, you know, Darlene, she's strong. She, you know, she, she's, you know, resilient, but you don't know that that's what I am. So like one of the other guests said on one of your segments, it's okay to touch my hand. It's okay to say, do you need a hug? It's okay to just to know that I'm a human being, but in order for me to move forward, you know, I, I had to talk to myself a lot and say, Darlene, Yes, counseling may have worked a little bit, but what are you going to do next? So I took over my husband's business. <laughs> and so I was like, I didn't know anything about a business. <laughs> I've always worked for somebody else. And so that's why I, I started there. I just said, you know, I've got to immerse myself into something different. And it just happens to be what he was doing, along with working full time. So, like I said, you got strength. Yeah, I got <laughs> so you're a superwoman, whether yeah, you realize yeah, yeah. it or not. Right, right. So then, what has happened on your personal relationship side? So over uh, over a few years, you know, I started dating. I was swiping left, swiping right. I had done all of the crazy dating stuff, and really, you know, you feel like you almost need to have somebody to replace what you had before. And then I realized, you know what, darling, you're never going to have that person. And, and it's okay because God has created you to, to have something different now. Don't know what that's going to look like. And so, um, last year, uh, and God is, is so, um, he has a sense of humor. Let me just say that. <laughs> yes, so I just happened to, I had a friend of mine, uh, I've had many people that have gone through the journey of losing a spouse. And one thing I can say, and I'll say it to the audience, that when someone, when you know somebody that's lost a spouse, please don't ever say, I understand, because you don't know what that feels like. You may have lost a sister, you may have lost a brother, or you may have lost a, another relative, but it's nothing like losing a spouse. But I can remember just um, last year, I had a friend of mine, very, uh, it wasn't even a friend, it was a, it was a person at our church, uh, lost his wife to, breast can uh, to brain cancer. And so um, I decided to reach out to somebody about, you know, going over to see that individual, which I'd never done before. 
I uh, didn't even know the person. And so I went over to their house and uh, shared my story. And voila, a year from that, engaged. Praise God. See, see how it works. See how he works. That was fast forward. Congratulations. <laughs> Understood. Understood. Congratulations. Let's see if we have a question from the audience. So my question is, given everything that you've been through, I mean, you, you kind of fast forwarded through a lot of things. I mean, what was, did you have therapy to help mm -hmm. you get through this? Because um, I, I rely so much on my husband, I don't, I can't even imagine. Right. Right. What, what that's like. Yeah, um, my kids, uh, in one of the other segments, I mentioned that my children had gone through Kate's Club. Uh, it's a program for kids that have lost a sibling or a, um, or a parent. For myself, uh, I did go through some counseling and it's really interesting when you deal with counselors because if, even though the counselor that I work with, she had lost a spouse, but the counselors that I had worked with, um, this particular individual, she was asking me to recall everything that happened. And it was a constant, you know, so let's talk about what happened next. So I was having to recall every single thing and I just didn't feel like I was getting the healing that I needed. So um, I stopped the counseling. And then I went to another, I went to a family therapist. But the one thing that really stood out for me when I went to this, the second counselor who was a family counselor, I was wearing my wedding band. And I told her, I said, this, uh, I don't know what it is about this band. I'm feeling smothered. I feel choked. I feel like I can't breathe. She said, well, take off the ring. You're not married anymore. And I said, hmm, I guess I'm not. That was the best counseling that I got because oftentimes we just feel like we're still stuck in the past or the present and can't move on. Thank you so much for your question. You know, as you can see, it's, it's really hard, but joy can come in the morning. And you know, I'm so happy and congratulations and you're moving forward and the kids have someone to look to as well. You know, I hope that you can see that all things happen in family. There's the good, the bad, you know, there's all kinds of things that we have to deal with. But I hope that you're seeing that there is good news on the other side. Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Hidden Stories Healed Now. See you next time.